Yeah, this is a uh, an interesting group because I find myself solidly in the middle between uh, production agriculture and the world of uh, wildlands conservation. And I, I think that's a good place to be. I feel like this is important and it has kept me motivated to keep doing my job for the last 20 years uh, because globally grazing lands are about half of the world's land area and uh, grazing lands support the livelihoods of millions of people. And at least in, in this country, most of the time grazing lands are uh, less productive or have less potential production agronomically than what we would consider uh, agricultural lands or crop lands, or they would already be in crop land. And uh, I, as a, <clears throat> as a range person and a bit of an idealist, I find it unspeakably sad that almost all of the tall grass prairie and the Palouse prairie uh, is gone. Uh, but grazing lands are really important because they provide a lot of other <clears throat> ecological goods and services. Excuse me. And, and my, I guess my conviction is that if we have the ability to do it well, namely produce some agricultural products, food and fiber in spaces where we can produce uh, ideally a full suite of ecosystem goods and services that we have uh, some obligation to do that. And that has been uh, something that keeps me right smack in this middle space between ranchers uh, who I interact with in order to try to help them do a better job managing land and uh, people who are often antagonistic toward uh, grazers because of the historical damage, real damage, permanent damage that's been done from uh, poorly managed grazing. So I want to talk a bit about grazing principles that we'll get to in a minute, but there's some, you know, there's some different big picture goals in grazing range lands that um, maybe are sometimes common across different people groups, but maybe not. But you have to ask first, what are range lands? And there's the textbook definition, which actually is different than what used to be the textbook definition. One of the difficulties of a group like this is that I have no idea who I'm talking to. I can't see them and I don't know them. And so I have no idea what your backgrounds were. Uh, so forgive me if it's insulting anybody if I point out that in the 1950s, I can't remember what the publication date was, but the standard Stoddard, Smith and Box rangeland text from the 1950s uh, literally described rangelands as everything that was left over once you excluded forests, urban areas, cropland, open water, ice fields, you know, pretty much everything else was considered rangeland. Uh, we've since, for quite a few years now, have been working off of a more positive description of what rangelands actually are instead of what they're not. And it really is any place where there's some kind of natural plant community that is uh, not a forest and that's dominated by grasses, grass likes, and shrubs. Uh, but interestingly, uh, in Nathan Sayre's 2017 book, Politics of Scale, A History of Rangeland Science, which I highly recommend uh, if uh, if some of you have not seen it. He says that rangelands are probably more like oceans than croplands or forests, namely because they're vast and variable and they resist micromanagement. Uh, so he defines rangelands somewhat cynically as non-forested places where more intensive economic activities have not yet taken root. Uh, and unfortunately, that is that is also a positive in terms of a, a positive description in the sense that it's probably an accurate description in the socioeconomic context of most of the world. And in fact, rangelands in the Pacific Northwest are most of what is left over if you exclude cropland and forest, uh, but those lands also happen to be pretty accurately described by the SRM definition I had a minute ago. Uh, this is this is actually a, a a GIS generated map that shows every land chunk that has less than 25% canopy cover. So this would include uh, the dry 
uh, forest types on the east side of the Cascades, which you can see uh, quite a bit of that highlighted in this uh, in this image. So, from my perspective, uh, many of those lands are grazed. Most of them are grazed, and so grazing management then has the potential to affect, for better or for worse, nearly two thirds of the land area of the Pacific Northwest. And I would contrast that with what I'm going to call agroecosystems, where uh, you, these are lands that are managed primarily, if not exclusively, for agricultural output, and only secondarily, uh, if at all, for other ecosystem goods and services. And I would say that uh, nearly all rangelands, even those that are managed with an eye mostly toward livestock production, are still producing other ecosystem goods and services. Uh, and certainly some of these agroecosystems are as well, especially uh, one like the one in the photograph, you know, which is a, a pasture rather than a cornfield. Um, yeah, but when I'm speaking with <clears throat> people that are not connected with agriculture, I like to point out that rangelands based livestock production really is unique as essentially the only form of food and fiber production that doesn't obliterate whatever was there before it. You don't plant a corn crop without taking out everything that was there before the corn crop. Uh, and uh, that's specifically not what we're doing with rangelands based livestock production. <clears throat> uh, one of the things that I wanted to, to talk about just briefly with this group is different ideas about how, how landscapes change. And uh, although this is not new information, one of the things that really stood out to me from Nathan Sayre's book, uh, again, I <laughs> highly recommend it, uh, as he, he pointed out something that we have known for some time, but hasn't really made its way necessarily into the way people think. Uh, one of his primary objectives in the book is to help people understand that most Western rangelands are characterized, defined by driven by ecosystem, ecosystem dynamics are driven by a variability even more than aridity. We tend to think of lack of water in dryland ecosystems as being the primary uh, limiting factor and the main variable in what influences vegetation change. But, but very likely the variability from year to year you know, within a range of values that we would still consider semi-arid in most situations is probably a much bigger driver than, than merely uh, low rainfall. And you know, one of the conclusions from that, uh, from the earlier idea about simple aridity, uh, was that we had, we, by we, I mean people who are managing Western rangelands are mostly operating on uh, a concept of vegetation change uh, that came from a guy named Frederick Clements from Nebraska, who described uh, mechanisms for, for plant community change that really were fairly applicable in, in, his, uh, in his world in the tall grass prairie and east toward uh, the deciduous forest, but not so much in semi-arid rangelands. And this idea is familiar to everyone because we still use that thinking many places. He had the idea that the ecosystem was left to its own devices, moving toward some version of a climax plant community. And you know, even the term climax presupposes this, this mechanism that uh, if you just left it alone, uh, that, that the plant community would snap back to or move toward uh, some diverse plant community oftentimes with a, a tree or a shrub component, and that that would be the end point of succession, meaning once it reached that spot, it would be stable in that, uh, in that um, plant community position uh, for a long period of time or until it was acted on by some disturbance, which moved it back the other direction. And he really he conceived this as like pushing on a spring, where if you, if you push on the spring, uh, you'll get a different plant community. And when you release the spring, meaning releasing the plant community from various kinds of disturbance, then it would move toward this climax plant community. Uh, we found that that really didn't hold true in the West, mostly because if you, if you 
there is uh, likely some sense of upward movement in the sense that if you leave a plant community alone for a while that has been under different kinds of disturbance, it will move toward a greater complexity, but it, it won't move toward the same complexity in every situation and in every landscape and in every soil type and in every combination of management variables uh, given the same original plant community. So we, we now recognize that there are multiple successional pathways that are possible and uh, many of them are, are potentially desirable. But the, one of the conclusions from Frederick Clements was that uh, gra grazing is the primary disturbance variable and, and perhaps it, it could be at least along with uh, a co-dominant disturbance like fire in the tall grass prairie. Uh, but his idea was that if you removed grazing pressure, you would automatically move back to that climax plant community. Uh, sorry to beat on this horse for a while, but I, I do think that it's important because it affects how we think about grazing. For the most part, many of us, and again by us, I'm saying a lot of ranchers and what I would call natural resource professionals in the West uh, have this idea that if grazing was the disturbance that caused a negative shift in species composition in the past, then removing grazing should automatically allow that to return to some, you know, some version of ecological nirvana, pre-Columbus environmental conditions, you know, you name it. Everybody's got their own idea of, of what that ideal plant community would look like. But uh, that is, in most cases, not the case. That kind of passive restoration, particularly once the uh, an ecosystem has passed some threshold, past the tipping point, where now we're in a new degraded state, but it's also a stable state, meaning it's going to stay there regardless of what we do with grazing, unless unless there are other inputs to that system, uh, some other effort to try to change uh, the species composition. So. I'm going to try to move on a little bit more quickly here. I may have to skip a few things to keep us on time, but um, I want to talk about what is driving rangeland health and also uh, a few guidelines that I think apply to grazing most places in the semi-arid west that, that will allow plant communities to move toward um, greater botanical diversity at least. Uh, and, and that is one of the primary drivers of soil health. Uh, so we certainly would be able to agree that grazing practices, climate, soil texture, time, and plant community structure are uh, interacting factors that, that over the long term define soil health and rangeland health. This comes straight out of the paper that's quoted on the screen here. Uh, and and I would also say that uh, light to moderate grazing on grasslands uh, has been shown to cause significant increases in soil health. Um, one measure of that could be soil carbon, as well as improvement in soil structure compared to heavy grazing. And this is a pretty consistent theme across grazing and rangelands literature across the last 50 years. Uh, light to moderate grazing, and we can be more specific about what exactly that means, has a very different effect than uh, the kind of heavy grazing that characterized uh, the century before that. And, and I would say really that came from that, that time period was likely uh, the middle 1800s, <clears throat> early 1800s through uh, approximately the turn of the century. You know, we have we have a number of pieces of legislation that came through Congress to deal with some of these problems like the Taylor Grazing Act uh, back in the, the teens, 20s and 30s in response to overuse. And again, I'm going back to Nathan Sarah's book. He makes a pretty compelling case that a lot of that was driven by easy credit and not necessarily by really catastrophically bad ideas about grazing management, uh, but that there was this uh, social and economic fervor at the time that, that, that drove uh, the increase in cattle barons and cattle numbers across the West that probably had not much to do with environmental conditions. Uh, 
So it's important if we're going to say that the different kinds of grazing affect ecosystems differently, it's important to identify the specific mechanisms involved in grazing. We can say grazing is good, grazing is bad. You know, people can talk to their blue in the face in a meeting room, uh, you know, trading talking points like this. But, you know, at the plant soil interface, at the individual plant level, at a uh, ecosystem site level, what are the actual things that are happening to the plant, to the plant community, to the soil by grazing animals that, that affect uh, land health, plant health? You know, the obvious things are defoliation, partial defoliation of an individual plant. We have patterns of defoliation within a landscape, you know, say on a hillside. Uh, at, at light stalking rates and uh, at with shorter uh, shorter grazing periods, you tend to have patches of grazing use with patches of ungrazed plants in between them. Uh, we have you know we have hoof impact on the soil uh, that has various kinds of effects depending on plants and soils and litter levels and animal concentration and how long the animals are present. At the plant level, uh, you know, these, these direct grazing effects have the secondary effect of uh, changing plant photosynthesis rates, the ratio of uh, where an individual plant uses its photosynthate, where it puts its energy, whether into roots or shoots. Some of that's based on defoliation amounts. Some of that's based on species specific metabolism and physiology, uh, where there's differences in where carbon is allocated within the plant and within the soil, grazing affects root mass and the things that are secreted by roots that affect soil health. Now, all of this is going on. And I want to come back just a second to this idea of aridity being or variability being the driving factor. Uh, this is a map of precipitation, um, but, but this is a map showing the variability in precipitation across the country. And uh, you can see in this yellow patch that represents a lot of central and south central Washington. And I think I would argue that a more recent analysis of this, uh, this these data go through 2002. I think that yellow patch would be a little bit bigger today. Uh, whether that's global climate change or whatever, I don't know, but but that variability I think is higher. And and this is since soil health depends on the maintenance of perennial plants, especially perennial grasses. A few years of overgrazing, say when we have one of these uh, lower precipitation years, the same level of grazing that might be sustainable in an average year. Uh, whatever average is may not be sustainable uh, in a drought year. And so um, static stalking rates that assume even arid but stable forage production over time may not be sustainable ecologically. So if we have a couple years during drought years of significant overgrazing, even though that stalking rate might have been light to moderate in a normal year, that can cause this plant community to tip over the edge uh, and, and convert relatively quickly into something that is now stable but degraded and undesirable. You know, and my message to ranchers is that, the, is that that has negative economic consequences, not just ecological consequences, because the plant community dominated by perennial grasses, desirable perennial grasses, is significantly more productive just in sheer pounds per acre than likely whatever you're going to get after we cross that threshold. Uh, furthermore, it the, per the, perennial, the perennial grass community is also uh, is also exhibiting active growth for a much longer period of time within the year. This also translates into fire risk because once we convert, we almost always convert to a plant community that is more prone to fire, um, meaning that we have this flush of growth of annual plants and some short-lived perennials in the springtime. 
or a perennials that have a short flush of growth and then a very long period of dry conditions. Whereas if we maintain uh, the native and naturalized perennials, especially perennial grasses, uh, the period of time during which those plants are dry enough to burn is significantly shorter. So if I'm, if I'm rancher Joe living in one of these places that has uh, a yellow or orange or a red patch, I have a very direct financial interest in preventing that plant community from crossing this threshold into a degraded but stable state. Uh, this is some data from Matt Reeves. Matt Reeves runs the Rangelands Production Monitoring Service. He's a, a research ecologist with the Forest Service out of Missoula, and uh, they have spent quite a lot of effort converting satellite data into forage production figures, not just so that we can track things like drought in real time, but also so that we can analyze the variability of these ecosystems in the past. Uh, so for the satellite systems that are being used for this data, uh, there's data going back to 1984, which is about where this chart begins, it might be 85. Uh, but you can see the level of variability in forage production on this particular BLM allotment in southeastern Idaho. Uh, and it's, although there appears to be a slight increase in the trend of production, the amount of variability from year to year in that production has gone up dramatically, where on a given year, we could have uh, something that's nearly twice the historical average or uh, half or less of the historical average of forage production. And this, uh, from a livestock production standpoint, and from uh, an interest in managing ecosystem health, this means that we need to be a little bit more adaptive and probably be flexible in how we are prepared to stock these ecosystems with grazing animals uh, now into the future. Yeah, this is highlighting the, the low years and the high years and the difference is significant. I mean, this low is around six to 700 pounds to the acre and the high is somewhere around 2,500 pounds to the acre. Uh, those those numbers make a very, very large difference in recommended stocking rates. We can see some of this variability uh, in local uh, photo monitoring data that I've collected over the last dozen years on the Puget Sound Energy wind farm east of Ellensburg. Um, these are photographs taken on, on the left, June 29th in 2011. And on the right, June 8th of 2015, uh, you can see the relative difference in this is primarily Sandberg bluegrass and a little bit of bulbous bluegrass on this particular spot that has clearly run out of, begun to run out of soil moisture in 2015 compared to 2011. Uh, this is what it looks like looking at the soil surface in those years. Pretty significant variability, uh, both in the, in the timing of plant community change and brown down, as well as total forage production in those years. So the things that we're want, wanting to be uh, at, attending to in thinking about grazing management are species composition. We would ideally like to see um, a diversity of functional structural groups that are representative of what should be there or, or could be there. One evidence of a healthy plant community is that you have good age class distribution. If there are only old plants in the plant community, it indicates that uh, plants are not reproducing successfully. Uh, and, and the amount of cover on the spaces between the plants either uh, bare ground or litter or other kinds of basal cover is pretty significant. Okay, I'm going to move a little bit more quickly here because I think I only had half an hour. You know, these ideas are not new. Tying grazing management to ecosystem health and specifically uh, soil loss. This is some research from the aftermath of the Dust Bowl in Nebraska, where researchers simulated rainfall on various levels of ground cover in native pasture. And they found that where you had 95% ground cover, 
if you applied three inches of rain over an hour and a half, uh, you had a little bit of runoff, but not too much. If you had only 75% ground cover, which, you know, if you're looking out across the ground instead of down onto the ground, that difference would be pretty subtle. At 75% ground cover, at, you began to experience soil loss and not just greater runoff. But the increase in runoff was quite significant. And at 50% ground cover, which would be pretty low for Nebraska, uh, you had 75% of the water running off and we're now losing a little over four tons per acre. Uh, so this, re this relationship between plant health and you know, what I consider to be a first order dysfunction of an unhealthy plant community, soil loss, uh, has been known for some time. So I want to take the last few minutes here to highlight some bad grazing or bad rules of thumb that led to unsustainable grazing practices and then identify some things that that are good ideas. And I apologize if I go just a little bit over, but I think we can come close. I like to say this is how the West was lost. And I think it for, to some extent, as I've already mentioned, some of these drivers were economic, but they were also some... Uh, ideas about grazing rangelands that worked on the, the mesic sod forming grasslands of Europe, where most of these settlers came from, and that also worked in the eastern United States, where you, again, had mostly, you know, 30 to 50, 60 inches of precipitation, sod forming grass communities that respond fundamentally differently to frequent defoliation by grazing animals than uh, the bunch grass communities. So that the rule of thumb that many of them applied, which some of you may have heard, is that a grass plant's goal in life is to produce a seed head, and the cow man's goal is to prevent it from doing that. And the idea, of course, is that you're delaying reproductive growth and you're keeping the plant in vegetative growth, where continually removing the apical meristem on those grass plants was stimulating additional tillering and uh, more basal leaf production. And that, that maintains forage quality later into the year. Whereas if we leave the plants alone at some point in response to day length and temperature, air temperature and soil temperature, uh, the plants begin reproductive growth and they try to produce a seed head. Uh, so if we apply, and then that kind of thinking had been applied on millions of acres of western rangeland, if we apply that goal of preventing the plant from producing seed, uh, we end up with this, with this uh, downward spiral, this uh, retrogressional sequence, where the dominant grasses, which are also in many cases the most preferred forage plants, are grazed during their peak of growth, they're grazed too tightly, uh, we end up with a situation where uh, some of this soil on the natural bare interspaces between bunch grass plants is not covered in the summertime. Uh, in many cases, we have season long grazing that results in animals regrazing the same plants over and over again. Uh, so now the perennial grasses are at a competitive disadvantage because they're not producing seed uh, and they're not being allowed uh, to uh, develop full leaf area in order to occupy the soil and generate maximum growth and compete with other plants that might be less desirable. Uh, so we end up with a, a lack of new plants. The old plants, remember this age class distribution, now we have an upside down pyramid where you only have old plants. Old plants do die, they don't live forever, and they um, fade out of the plant community. Uh, so now plants that are either resistant or tolerant to that level of defoliation begin to expand and increase in both uh, extent and in their abundance. And in, you know, in our context, that often looks like sagebrush, cheatgrass, knapweed, native short grasses. And then once there's enough fire frequency, we lose the sagebrush. And now what we're left with is something that's not very productive, it's flammable, it doesn't protect soil health, and it's not providing ecosystem goods and services. 
at that point, we've crossed this ecological threshold into a new but stable and undesirable plant community. Uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break here for me to tell you about some case study uh, sort of short film documentaries that a group of us at WSU produced a few years ago. Uh, these are this was a grant from the Northwest Climate Hub uh, to do about eight to 10 minute videos on ranchers in Washington, Oregon and Idaho that were managing for what we called ecological resilience. Uh, and these three different, so these are, these are pretty good videos. I'm not a videographer. My job was to interview the ranchers while somebody else managed the camera and worked the storyboard and figured things out. Uh, but we have, uh, we have eight to 10 minute videos on each of these ranches and they're paired with a case study publication that describes uh, the scientific basis for what they're doing. Uh, the first one here is about Russ Stingley. Russ is the rancher that runs cattle on the wind farm east of Ellensburg that I've worked with for about 15 years. Uh, this one really speaks to uh, what we called ecological resilience, meaning managing a plant community for maximum um, plant community diversity and uh, habitat value. The next one is Brenda and Tony Richards. They're ranchers down in the Owyhees in southern Idaho. And we focused on social resilience uh, because of their efforts to work with local fire agencies on both preventing and responding to wildfire in south southeastern Idaho. And then uh, the Oregon rancher was Jack Southworth. Some of you may know him if you've done work in Oregon. Uh, he's down in Bear Valley. And Jack is a, a pretty sharp feller. And his case study focused on uh, what we called operational resilience, meaning he's trying to be really responsive in terms of flexible stocking rates in order to capture economically those years where we have uh, well above average forage production, but also be responsive so that when we have a drought year, uh, he's not, yeah, he's not overgrazing those plant communities. And I can, I can, put this URL in the chat box or email it later. Uh, so quickly, I want to talk just a little bit about some, some of my conclusions on grazing principles to maintain rangeland health, soil health, ecosystem health, whatever you want to call it. These things are all tied together. Uh, the first one is a light to moderate stocking rate. And by light to moderate stocking rate, I'm referring to a stocking rate calculation that plans to remove using livestock approximately 25 to 35% of the net annual increase in forage. Uh, and of course that's specific to the year. And because these things are variable, this can be a little bit difficult to hit. Uh, but one of the principles here again, is that if we're using say 25% of the plant community uh, for grazing animals on a year that is forage short, we might be using 50%, which likely would be sustainable still if that only happens every once in a while. A moderate stocking rate, you know, most, uh, most rangeland experts would say is in the 35 to 50% range and above 50% would be considered moderate to heavy stocking rate. So observing a light to moderate stocking rate tends to cover over a multitude of sins in that uh, you're going to end up with significant parts you know, of a landscape like this that don't get grazed at all if you have a light stocking rate. And for some ranchers that feels like they're leaving money on the table. Uh, and I have worked pretty hard over the last 20 years to convince them that that's more like having money in the bank and it's really quite important ecologically and financially. Uh, the second general idea is that in most semi-arid plant communities, limiting the duration of the grazing period is, is, I still think, important. Even if we're observing a light stocking rate and we have, say, 200 animals across 20,000 acres, uh, that is a sustainable stocking rate. But if those animals are on there for eight months, which again is not exceeding the amount of allowable forage that should be sustainable, the animals are going to end up using their favorite places and their favorite plants over and over. So even though there's a raging academic debate about whether or not rotational grazing does any good, 
it's been my observation through a number of years now of uh, working with a lot of these ranchers directly that a landscape like this where you have um, a healthy stocking rate but a long grazing period ends up with the places that are um, flat ground better grass better watered closer to water being used more heavily than what is sustainable long term and will eventually convert those spots so having shorter grazing periods whatever shorter might be but for sure for sure shorter than six months is nearly always a good idea uh, the next general principle that you know is pretty well captured in all of the nrcs uh, and agency grazing specs at this point is that these bunch grasses rely on seed production for reproduction primarily and so if they are never allowed to go to seed uh, then the plant community will shift toward less desirable species that are not as effective at producing uh, habitat values and at holding the soil together. So grazing after seed shatter every once in a while uh, is widely considered uh, a really beneficial practice for rangeland rehabilitation. In fact, there was a, there was a paper by Wayne Burkhart and Ken Sanders. Ken was the University of Idaho range specialist for many years and Wayne Burkhart's a, a fairly well-known range researcher going back a long ways. They analyzed the last 75 years of literature on specifically spring grazing of blue bunch wheatgrass to see what are the conclusions after um, nearly a century of research on how to do this right. And one of their conclusions was that if we let these plants go to seed periodically, whatever that means, however that happens, nearly any management around that is going to end up being sustainable, but they've got to produce seed every once in a while. All right, uh, item number four is that the, the plants really need some growing season regrowth before grazing again. So if we're grazing a plant community in September and October, it doesn't work very well to come back to that spot on March 15th. Those plants need some time to generate leaf area and conduct photosynthesis and rebuild, uh, rebuild themselves before they're exposed to a grazing animal again. Uh, and observing or aiming for light to moderate utilization sort of follows from a light to moderate stocking rate, but the two things don't always go together for reasons that I've already described. With a sustainable stocking rate, we could still have heavy utilization on individual plants. And so it's pretty important uh, for livestock producers to be not trying to graze this plant all the way down to two or three inches uh, because much of what little carbohydrate storage there is in the plant that's responsible for mobilizing new growth in the spring is in the basal portion of the stem and not in the roots and not in the crown. And it also provides some significant surface roughness that's important for conserving snow, which is pretty important in a wintertime precipitation pattern landscape where most of our precipitation comes as snow. Here's another example of relatively light uh, grazing utilization on a bunch grass landscape. And I think I'm out of time, I'm probably past time. Uh, the last thing I wanna say is that there have been a number of studies to identify the common management factors in ranches that have healthy riparian zones and uplands. Uh, and there was, in, in fact, a pretty large scale survey conducted by University of California Davis a number of years ago, maybe 10 years ago, uh, specific looking at riparian health related to management factors. And one of the things that they found really two conclusions. One of them was that uh, a significant correlating factor was livestock distribution effort. Most range experts would say we don't very often have stocking rate problems anymore. What we usually have is livestock distribution problems, and this seems to be true. It's especially true with regard to riparian health. And so efforts to um, move animals around to get more even use across the landscape tend to pay for themselves, whether that's water distribution, supplement, salt, herding, uh, and herding is not the same thing as chasing. And we've done a bit of work to try to help branchers 
uh, understand some of that. But livestock distribution effort and having a manager who has a distinct goal in his head or her head for what the landscape should look like after the animals are done with it uh, also carries an awful lot of weight. Uh, and interestingly, a lot of the bigger ranches that have begun using herders, um, probably more than 50% of those herders are, are females. And in the world of range management, uh, there's a, a very large number of, of females who are uh, coming in and doing a, a pretty good job in a world that used to be mostly a man's world. The last thing I wanted to mention is that relatively minor shifts in grazing management can have pretty large results. This is just a side-by-side -side contrast on Dixie Creek in Nevada. Uh, the, the plant community in the background uh, is grazed by cattle by a larger number of animals actually than what's in the foreground, but the animals are present for a shorter period of time and the plant community has a chance to regrow from, from that grazing pressure. And it makes a gigantic difference, particularly in riparian function uh, and riparian habitat. So this, this ecological resilience uh, really does promote profitability for ranchers in several key ways. The biggest one is that you're maintaining maximum forage yield when we're conserving a biologically diverse plant community. And then of course there's reduced fire risk uh, because of the difference in how plant communities uh, <clears throat> burn and, and uh, have discontinuous fuel if we maintain perennial natives. And then I think one of the more compelling things that's really interesting that I'd like to spend some more time uh, teaching on with ranchers is that where animals have access to a wide diversity of plant species, both grasses and forbs and shrubs, uh, this supports animal health. And there's actually some pretty good scientific studies showing that uh, the costs of treating sick animals, sick calves in particular, on uh, say an irrigated pasture with three or four grass species versus a rangeland like this that probably has 50 to 60 species in a say a 30 meter square species richness plot uh, that is a, a very large difference the animals that are grazing the more diverse plant community are measurably healthier all right i've gone a ways past time uh, we were going to talk a bit about the podcast and if anybody has time for questions, I can still answer some of those. But uh, what I would encourage you to do is subscribe to the Art of Range podcast in your favorite podcasting app, or you can listen to it directly at theartofrange.com. And there's an episode, I'm not maybe episode 17, somewhere in that ballpark where uh, I'm describing some of the thinking behind the podcast. There's also an article in the Rangelands Journal uh, from 2020 that also describes uh, the purpose behind the podcast. And I'm happy to provide that to anybody who would like it. So I'll leave this up for a minute and uh, I can stay on for questions if you have any time.